We have a great program today, so uh, I will just say two words about the program first. We start with a talk about from Anoya rocket range to Anoya space. And after that we will have the, the, the Yara Brickland prize will be presented and then we will have the this year's um, Brickland lecture. Um, Contents in the sky, following Earth leaky atmosphere into space. Our first speaker today, he is uh, not here, but he is <laughs> up there, <laughs> waving to us. So it's um, Katie Olsen, he is the, uh, the CEO of the uh, Anoya Space and also the president of Anoya Space. So, so he will have the first lecture, lecture and, and, uh, and he will talk about uh, the 50 years of the, from rocket, on the rocket range to on the space, and we all look forward to listen to your talk. Thank you. Good afternoon from, uh, from Hotel Room in Paris, and thank you, uh, Eivin, for the kind introduction. And of course, also thank you for the invitation to talk to such a unique audience. I'm sorry I cannot be with you today, but uh, I guess we are getting used to this way of communicating after two and a half years now with the pandemic. I'm very pleased to invite you with me on a special journey this Tuesday afternoon as we will travel with on the space from ground into orbit over a 60 year period. Next slide, please. Sparks are very useful things. The most useful sparks of all was probably the one which ignited the Big Bang. Next slide, please. As a matter of fact, we use sparks every day in our lives as an everyday tool. We use it for cooking food, we use it in factories, we use it for transportation, and last but not least, next slide, please. We use it for launching rockets. Yes, some rocket motors use the sparks to ignite the fuel in order to send the rocket to space. But there is another type of spark which is even more powerful and which facilitated Norway's entrance into space. Next, please. And that was the spark of an idea. More precisely, the idea of Christian Birkeland, which led to, as most of you know, the famous Terella experiment, which kick-started a plethora of Norwegian research into space science, like the Aurora, how the sun affects the Earth, space weather, and so on and so forth. It enabled the creation of Anoya space, and over two Norwegian launch sites at Anoya and Svalbard for research rockets, which now has been operational in the name of science for 60 years. We've launched rockets and balloons, and we have flown aircraft and operated ground-based scientific instruments through all these years. Next, please. Anoya Space started as a cooperation between NASA and the Norwegian Defense and Research Establishment with the launch of the first suborbital rocket on August 18th, 1962. So just a month ago, we passed 60 years. The purpose of Anoya Space is to provide infrastructure for and facilitate technology testing and scientific research for commercial companies, the research community, and for public administration. Next, please. The aerospace island with its ground-based instrumentation, technical infrastructure, great harbors, and a long military runway provide excellent infrastructure to fulfill these obligations. Next, please. In addition to our heritage of 60 years and more than 1,000 suborbital scientific rockets, we now offer one of Europe's most modern and technologically advanced test sites for unmanned aircraft, military harbor, harbor sorry, and techno technology testing. Anoya Space Defense is celebrating its 25th year's anniversary this year, 
and with a new and very challenging security environment and an ongoing war in Europe, we see an increased demand for these services from the national side as well as from our NATO allies. Next, please. At the turn of the millennium, we added Andreas based education to our portfolio. Yearly, we reach out physically to 6,000 students from kindergarten and up to PhD level to promote STEM, that is science and technology, engineering and mathematics, and to spread the word on space. Add another 60,000 visitors to our website and you see what impressive tool this is to reach out to new space explorers. We have a special relationship with the European Space Agency to arrange a student camp every summer where selected students from Europe and North America can come and be part of the program. The students will build their own payload and their own instrumentation and at the end of the week they will take on all roles and launch their own student rocket. How is that for a rocket scientist in Spain? Next slide please. We are now taking this to a new level. As we build as a Norwegian spaceport at Andøya to launch small satellites into orbit. In June 2020, the Norwegian parliament made an anonymous decision to support Andøya spaceport and Andøya space was in October 2021 given green light for the funding. In March 2022, the construction of the satellite launch facility began. Andøya Spaceport will act as a launch site operator, providing services to launch site operators. What you actually see on the screen here is the building just going on. This was taken about a week ago. Up in the, the upper side of the picture, you can see the assembly integration and test building. And what you see in front is the launch pad it's about 60 by 100 meters, and the construction in the middle there is actually what is called the flame trench, where we will actually launch or monitor, put up the rocket and launch from there. Next slide, please. Andrea Spaceport is ideally located for launches into polar and synchronous orbits with low sea and air traffic, and from existing operations has already been granted a 25,000 square kilometer test area surrounding the island for unmanned aircraft, missile testing, and also for rocket operations. Um, with a spaceport, we can deliver one and a half tons payload into polar and sun synchronous orbits. But Katrin, the one you see on the screen, why do we need a new launch site? What is actually the difference between a research rocket and an orbital rocket? Next, please. The biggest difference between a, a research rocket and an orbital rocket is that the research rocket stays suborbital, so that means it goes up and comes down very fast again, and that the orbital rocket is uh, meant to bring payloads into orbit. For that, much more energy is needed, and that makes the orbital rocket much bigger. Of course, it also carries more payload and also carries all the systems um, that are needed to deploy the payload into the orbit. Next slide, please. We are currently working towards an initial operating capability, which will be the first launch pad with the needed support buildings and a temporary launch and mission control. We do this to be ready for the first launch in 2023. The launch pad you see here is built to the specifications of the German-based ISAR Aerospace and their Spectrum launch vehicle. But our business case is more that of an airport. Anio Space provides uh, the airport, the runway, the hangars and everything else which our customers use to prepare their rockets for flight and then launch. That means we hope to host other rocket companies at Andrea. Next slide, please. In the end, 
The fully constructed spaceport will have two, maybe three launch pads, several support buildings, and a permanent launch and mission control. The spaceport will have a launch cadence capacity of up to 30 launches per year. Next slide, please. But Catherine, what do we need all these satellites for? Next, please. The expectations of the general public are growing. All of us want to be able to communicate where we are. We want to be able to pay with our credit cards where we are, and we want to be able to navigate around the world. For that, more and more satellites up in space are needed. Also to fight climate change, we have to understand first what is happening around the globe. For that, more and more Earth observation satellites are needed for research, but also to monitor in real time what is happening. Next slide, please. There are several advantages to Anoya as a launch site. When the launch vehicles fly out from Anoya, they are able to reach orbit without crossing the territories of other countries. And the first stage can safely be disposed of in the Norwegian Sea. We also have a relatively low density airspace. And Anoya enjoys good logistics options. It is the only island in Norway to have three types of ports, a seaport, an airport, and now a spaceport. Next slide, please. Through a new spaceport, we want to lift the Norwegian space industry to a completely new level, and at the same time, empower the European space sector. Next slide, please. But we cannot do all this alone. We want you and others to join us in this effort. We want to facilitate new sparks of ideas in the future, so it is very important to us to establish the spaceport inside an ecosystem. We want everybody to contribute, to see possibilities, to invest, create new breakthrough technologies. An innovation center will enable students and others to invent, build, fail, invent again, build again, and then succeed. But we will also need services one not necessarily think of as crucial. At Anoya, the various launch teams need accommodations, restaurants, even hairdressers. Not me, maybe, but the others. The launches will for sure attract people who want to watch the launch in person, and they too will need hotels, rental cars, and so on. The Space Force is and will be a Norwegian and, and European resource. Next slide, please. Norway has been at the forefront of auroral research for centuries, and the research spawned a highly capable science community that studied the phenomenon from the ground. In modern times, advances in rocket technology meant that the aurora borealis could be studied from within. The scenic island of Anna, located in northern Norway in an area where the northern lights appear frequently, was chosen as the launch site, and on August 18, 1962, the very first Norwegian civilian suborbital research rocket took to the skies. From there, Anna Space was born, enabling scientists to explore Earth's atmosphere. For six decades, Anaya Space has stood shoulder to shoulder with scientists, engineers, customers and partners in countless missions to explore the unknown, test new technology, inspire and educate the next generation explorers, and move our world forward. We are now ready to lift Norway's space industry up to a new level by building and operating a launch facility for small satellites. Together, we empower explorers. At Omnia Space, we focus on technology but it is these incredible crew you saw in action in this video and their knowledge and dedication that enables us to fulfill our commitments 
for the benefit of society and business. Thank you for your attention. So, so then I would like to do, thank you for a very interesting lecture. So, uh, so, so then we can start on the next point on our agenda, the Yara Birkland Prize for 2022. So I would like to give the floor to Per Knudsen. He's the Vice President of Technology for Yara International, and he will present uh, this year's prize. Thank you. Dear Laureate, Dean, Professors, Ladies and gentlemen, every year we celebrate and remember Christian Birkeland uh, by handing out the Birkeland Award. An award named after a remarkable scientist given to another remarkable scientist. In Yara, we are extremely proud of our heritage. The science of Christian Birkeland led to what has been called the most life-saving innovation ever, mineral fertilizer. Billions of life saved. This year, it has been even more apparent the contribution Christian Birkeland made to the world. After Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we have seen an intensification of the global food crisis so far this year, 400 million more people have become food insecure. And we have seen world leaders suddenly speaking about the importance of fertilizer and keeping food production high. And food security is only one of the challenges the world is facing. And if you add the climate emergency, the geopolitical instability, the world really has some incredible challenges. While we gather here tonight, others are gathering in New York for the UN General Assembly week. Among them, our CEO, Sven Tore Holseter. And one of the things he spends a lot of time talking about there is the need for collaboration working across industries, companies working together with governments and NGOs and academia. Because we cannot hide in our own silos anymore if we are there to solve the pressing global challenges. And that is also why I'm so very happy to be able to award this year prize to Dr. Kaichi Suki because one of the things that characterizes your work is the ability to work outside silos. Dr. Su really has the ability to work across building bridges between, for example, electrochemistry, physics, biotechnology, and bioengineering. In addition, he has done a significant work within renewable energy which is another area where Yara as a company is really pushing forward in order to decarbonize. His scientific work on green hydrogen is definitely something I know that has been read thoroughly among colleagues. Before we hand out the prize, I would like uh, Professor Tore Hemmingsen to give the uh, judgment, uh, the reasoning for the award prize. Thank you for being invited to this uh, ceremony. You can hear me now. Yeah, thank you. The Yara Birkeland Prize for 2022 in chemistry is awarded to Kaisu Xu for his PhD thesis titled Artificial Photosynthesis, Advanced Nanomaterials and Use of Biocatalysts, Rises for, no, uh, for Novel Photoelectrochemical Cells. Kaisu Xu was awarded a PhD degree, degree in May 2020 at the University of Oslo. His research was done at the Electrochemistry Group, 
at the Department of Chemistry in the period 2016 to 2020. Under the supervision by Professor Truls Nurby and Dr. Anton Nasios Shatsitsatikis, his thesis includes five papers pub published in highly ranked international journals, with uh, Sue being first author of four. Later, five more papers have been published from his work. Photosynthesis in plants is the basis for making energy in the form of carbohydrates. From simple components as carbon dioxide and water with the help of energy from the sun. This process was discovered already in 1779 by Jan Ingenhaus. However, to copy a process in nature is not always simple. Sus Sus research is cross-scientific with the disciplines electrochemistry, semiconductor physics, catalysis, biotechnology, and bioengineering. And as mentioned by Knudsen, he's working out of the silos. His ambition was to convert CO2 into bioenergy by artificial uh, photosynthesis, and he successfully developed a method to produce solar fuel by enzymatic reduction in a photoelectrochemical cell using photocatalytic material. By the use of a new type of photocatalytic material, an efficient photoelectrochemical regeneration of NIDP, uh, NIDH on the level of natural photosynthesis was achieved. This work was published in a high-ranking journal, Applied Catalysis B Environmental. Dr. Xu has also contributed to cutting-edge research within renewable energy, which led to new electrochemical methods to split water into hydrogen and oxygen with the use of sunlight. A sustainable process for production of green hydrogen from humid air was developed. This method may turn out to be useful for production of hydrogen in area with poor infrastructure. Eight candidates were nominated for this year's Yara Prize. And many of these uh, theses are of a very high level. However, the work in Schuh's thesis is of extremely high quality and ambitious and its research contributes in central areas of sustainability and renewable energy in the spirit of Birkeland. Schuh's work is innovative, future-oriented, cross-scientific, including nanomaterials, biocatalysis, photoelectrochemistry, and sustainable, including artificial photosynthesis and green hydrogen production. His work is expected to contribute to new technology with artificial photosynthesis and within the production of solar fuels. We are looking forward to see the progress of this work. Congratulations. So, Dr. Su, on behalf of Yara, it's an honor to award the prize to you. I'm Kai Ji. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Yara Big Lang Prix uh, Committee to give me uh, this surprise. It's really my honor and a surprise <laughs> to win the prize. Um, it's uh, mind blowing to be here. I've been here twice. The first time I was brought by my supervisor, and uh, it's the Old Hustles uh, event. So I saw a lot of uh, uh, nice scientists like excellent scientist presenting here. And this is my second time, and I have no idea that it, it is my turn to give the presentation. So I uh, really appreciated this chance. Um, as, uh, as I already mentioned, my PhD work was about artificial photosynthesis. And uh, now I'm working in nail hydrogen. 
So uh, I would like to uh, introduce a bit about NELD. <laughs> it is my company, and uh, you can see it is an uh, advertisement. <laughs> so uh, NELD is a faster growing company. Um, we uh, only work on green hydrogen production. So we uh, develop new facilities, like ele mainly electrolyzers, for green hydrogen production. And I'm working in the technology group in, uh, in NEL, and it is located in uh, Nordhorden, which is uh, like a 120 kilometers driving distance from Oslo. It's a bit far away. And this, this picture was taken from my office. So if you uh, see uh, through the window directly from my, from my office, you can see uh, this uh, gentleman standing here. Now if I uh, look closer, and he's uh, Christian Bickland. And this is the prototype of the famous uh, uh, electric arc uh, device that together with uh, some either, they used it to fix nitrogen at that time to produce the first uh, version of artificial fertilizer. So uh, here is a small pathway. It's a shortcut to uh, the lab in the technology group. So I use this shortcut every, every day when I was working. So then I pass by Bitcoin every day. So it's very funny and fascinating to win the prize that named after person that you meet every day <laughs> in, the, in the work. So uh, it's uh, really fun to me. <laughs> okay, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Christian Bildkland is famous for his uh, scientific research on the uh, northern light. And my work is also related to light. Uh, it is uh, full spectrum sunlight. So we want to utilize the sunlight and convert the sunlight into useful chemicals. Also, if we can convert CO2 and capture CO2 into sort of useful form, then it would be perfect. And then this process, nature does it already long, long, long time, and nature is the expert. So we want to be, uh, we, so we want to mimic the natural photosynthesis. And if we see the natural photosynthesis in an extremely simplified way, so it can be uh, characterized in two steps. The first step is actual water splitting. So it is a water electrolysis. This needs the energy from the sunlight. So the, when the green plant receives the energy from sunlight, it can crack water molecule and then produce proton and oxygen. Of course, in the meantime, it will activate a lot of enzymes, tons of enzymes. And with the help of the enzyme and proton, then CO2 will be captured and converted into useful form. For example, sugar or starch. And we want to mimic this process. Of course, it is the idea for my brilliant supervisor, Tours Norby. And this is the brilliant uh, device. Of course, our ultimate goal is to have a three-layer device. With the first layer, capture the sunlight and cracking water molecule. Second layer is the membrane that allow proton and electron to go through. While on the backside, it is uh, loaded with catalyst that can do hydrogen production or do CO2 uh, capture and reduction. So this is the ultimate goal. But when we started the project, we were thinking maybe we started with the first step to water splitting and hydrogen production. So uh, when we say that we want to utilize the sunlight and then do water splitting to produce hydrogen, then already we have two technologies that are commercially available. You can buy a photovoltaic and uh, an electrolyte, for, exam for example, PEM from Dell, combine them together. Then uh, you will produce uh, green hydrogen from the, from the sunlight. But what we, are, we, what we were doing is that we merge these two together into a single, single device. So then this first layer is a semiconductor. It, it absorbs the light from the sunlight, and then it is activated. It has the energy to crack water molecule into oxygen and proton, and in the same time, it produces uh, electricity. So it is something like a photovoltaic or solar cell. Uh, we just uh, make it into a smaller scale and then put it on the first layer. And then the electron will pass through to the, cath uh, to the other side. And the proton will go through the membrane in the middle. And then the proton comb recombine with the electron and we produce hydrogen. So this technique is called photoelectric chemistry, um, developed maybe more than 40 years ago by to Japanese, and then we were still developing it. <laughs> so it's a very long way uh, to uh, make it uh, com commercialized. And this is our first version of the device. 
the first layer, we choose uh, titania. It's the most uh, intensely researched material. So it's a safe choice. And the membrane in the middle is nephium. So uh, you can find it in the commercial available PAM electrolyzer. And also uh, the cathode uh, on the other side, we use a platinum carbon black. It, was, it is also commercial available. So we just use three commercial available thing and press them together to form the device. And we got hydrogen production when we exposed the first layer to sunlight. It's very, very low in efficiency, very low. So we, we should use like uh, gas chromatography or even mass spectros uh, MS to detect the hydrogen production. So uh, we, th we were thinking then we should really dive into material science to develop a new uh, photo absorber. And then we searched in the literature and we choose this material, tantalum nitride. It has perfect uh, property, physical property to carry out the photoelectrochemical process. We started with uh, pure tantalum foil and then we, uh, uh, with the surface treatment, we grow nanotubes on the surface. So this is how it looks like. It has a lot of like tube-like uh, structure, but it's also very porous. And tantalum nitride, it can absorb a lot of sunlight. But the problem is that it has very low kinetics to convert to uh, or to oxidize water. So the kinetics are very, very, very low. So instead, we need to uh, put another co-catalyst on top of the tantalum nitride. And then we put another electrocatalyst called cobalt hydroxide on top of that to achieve very high performance. And by the way, this is the single nanotube that we uh, took from, from our electrode. You can see that it's uh, extremely porous already. And this is how it works in reality. Um, I also have uh, videos. And you can see that this is the light coming from in the front, and then the, it's bubbling like crazy. And then we collect the bubble here, and then we see that the oxygen is, uh, uh, is accumulated. So what is happening here is actually water splitting. And, uh, we put another like platinum mesh here, so then the hydrogen will be produced at this side. The, the, those bubbles are actually hydrogen. So uh, this material is really good, uh, very high performance, but the stability is uh, problematic. <coughs> so we tried really hard to push uh, the stability to a high level. Um, when, when I say high level, it's like several hours. So this is the maximum I can, uh, I can go <laughs> when I was doing my PhD. Also, we also did a little bit more uh, research on the toxicity test, just for environmental uh, uh, aspect. We want to see how uh, our material is environmental friendly. So we expose our material to human cell. And then we can see that beer tandem nitrite, they are quite, quite okay. Uh, with like several days, the human cell has almost 100% viability. So it's not toxic to human cell, but if we have our co-catalyst loaded, and you can see that there is a viability decrease. So this is because the cobalt is toxic. Yeah. So when, uh, when one is using the cobalt as a uh, co-catalyst, then uh, one should pay attention to the environment. Yes. And then we uh, did more about the, uh, uh, the other side, the back side, because platinum is very expensive. And then one of the goal of the project is to replace the platinum with a biocatalyst. In the beginning, we have two choice. One is uh, formate dehydrogenase. This enzyme is very unique. It can convert CO2 into formic acid. And this is uh, a nickel iron hydrogenase. It is also very unique. It can convert the proton into hydrogen. But then this enzyme, we, have, we had uh, really a lot of problems working with this enzyme. Uh, we didn't make it work. So then we uh, refocused on this enzyme and then uh, again, uh, in the beginning, a lot of uh, problems. This is because we, at that time, we didn't have enough understanding of the enzyme. Then we really dip into the literature and figure out how it works. Then we, uh, we know how it works and then we integrate it into our system. Instead of having like compact three layer system, at that time we, we thought it's safer to separate them into three different parts just to start with something easier. So again, you can see the three like layer structure here. This is the front layer that absorbs the energy from the sunlight. 
and this is the membrane in the middle, and this is the cathode. But this time, we have enzyme in it. So here is how things work. When the sunlight hit uh, the tandem nitride nanotubes, it got excited, and water molecule will be cracked into proton, oxygen, and uh, electron. We send the electron back to the cathode, proton through the membrane and also to the cathode. And then uh, with a lot of like uh, complicated intermediates, we were able to let the enzyme convert CO2 into formic acid. And then how, how we know that? We will simply uh, collect the solution here and then send it to NMR. Uh, you don't have to know the, all this uh, complicated picks. Uh, I don't know either. So uh, only focus on this, this one. So this is the control. The same setup, but without sunlight. We don't turn down the sun. So then there is uh, almost no peak. But when, when we turn on the sunlight, then we clearly see there's a peak emerging. And then we add formic acid into it, we see this peak is enlarging. So then we know that we produce uh, actually formic acid. And we also quantify it, and we found out that it's almost 100% quantum efficiency. So this is really uh, amazing, but uh, very low uh, quantity. Yes, um, all the things I, do, uh, I did was uh, pretty low in quantity. All right, and uh, next step would be to press all three compartments together and then to really realize the artificial photosynthesis mimicking the na natural uh, green leaf. Unfortunately, this was the end of my PhD, so I, I didn't have time to continue. So uh, maybe this can be the future project. <laughs> so now I'm working from the full spectral sunlight to a very spe specific light with 410 nanometer wavelength. This is because this is one of the emission lights of hydrogen when hydrogen was uh, excited. And this is also the color of nail. You can find it everywhere. So this is the lab in nail that I'm working in technology group. So we have uh, a lot of uh, stacks and uh, test stations, which I'm responsible for them. So I'm testing electrode, membrane, uh, val both validation and developing. So this is the work I'm now. I hope I can contribute more to the green uh, hydrogen production and renewable energy uh, shift uh, to the industry. So with all this, I would like to thank all this, um, uh, my partners, people are really treasured to me. So uh, without uh, the cooperation between, among all these partners, we cannot make, it, make this uh, project uh, successful. And also thank Fashion Fush Insulada to provide uh, this uh, uh, project, funding for this project. And also, of course, my two dear uh, supervisors, uh, I received uh, tremendous support from them. Yes, with all that, thank you for your attention. Uh, distinguished lecturer, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's a great pleasure to be here, as always. It's always a pleasure to take part in the Birklam event. And so also this year, it's excellent because the lectures are excellent, the dinner is excellent, and the people are excellent, so really. <laughs> Dr. Douglas Rowland, congratulations. Thank you for accepting the invitation and warm welcome, of course. Before presenting Dr. Rowland, I would like to take you a little bit back in time to another distinguished scientist, the science that, scientist that we are also honoring today, Christian Birkla. And my office in the center of Oslo, my second office, it's in the center of Oslo, that's the same building where Christian Birkla was walking around a long time ago, and it's really something that uh, you feel in the heart from time to time. He was one of the greatest researchers and innovators ever and a professor of physics at the University of Oslo. His life and work continues to excite us and interest us, I think, more than 100 years after his death. Birkland was the first scientist to realize that northern lights had something to do with electromagnetic storms on the sun, and he was responsible for 60 new patents for everything from margarine and caviar to the electromagnetic gun cannon, which was more important, I think. And he was behind the fantastic invention that enabled making fertilizers by harvesting nitrogen from the air. The discovery was the basis for the establishment of Norsk Hydro. In today's language, we would say that Norsk Hydro was a spin-out of the University of Oslo, of course. But, uh, 
Still, his main interest and motivation was basic science. And to some extent, he did the innovation in order to get, to get money for his basic science. Uh, he pioneered a new modus operandi by combining theory with experimentation, simulation, and calculations, and he led foundations for much of the modern research conducted in the field of space and solar physics. Birkland was one of the first space scientists and continues to inspire new generations of students and scientists. One of them, I believe, is Dr. Ovlen, uh, this year's Birkland lecture. Dr. Lund earned his PhD in physics from the University of Minnesota in 2002. You have worked on NASA Goddard Space Flight Center since 2003, currently serve as the chief of NASA's laboratory for the ionosphere, thermosphere, and mesosphere physics. And your scientific research uses sounding rockets that probe the Earth's upper atmosphere from 100 to 1,000 kilometers altitude. And is motivated to understand variations in the space environment that are, of course, of large importance for understanding how the world is put together, but also how this can impact human society and technology. Since 1998, you have been involved in over a dozen of different rocket missions to study the phase phenomena, taking rockets to Alaska, Marshall Islands, Virginia, but here today, even more important to you all soon and to Anne, of course. Uh, that's important. And I had been the pleasure to be to Anne and see the, the fabulous, uh, how to say, um, system that we have at Anne. And that's really something that we should be proud of. If you haven't been to Anne, you have to go there. Uh, and your field of study, Aurora, lightning, host of other fascinating phenomena in the Earth space, of course. In 2013, 2018, you led the visions and the Visions 2 missions to study the processes that heat Earth's atmosphere and eject it into space in atmospheric fountains. And that is what we're going to hear more about a little bit later. The Vision 2 rocket mission was a core part of the Norway-US-Japan sounding rocket program named the Grand Challenge Initiative CUSP. And the GCE CUSP, which came, I believe, after the Norwegian initiative, was the biggest scientific rocket program ever with 12 sounding rockets launched from Svalbard and Onaya from 2018 to 2021. And Dr. Roblin, you were and is a key pioneer. We are a key person in the success of the GPI CUSP project, which was a game changer also because you went from having single rockets to having multi-rocket missions. So there, friends, everything connects to everything. In his presentation earlier today, Katie Lulsen uh, presented what was going on on Anoya in a presentation called Science and Technology, Anoya Space. He took us through the advancement of technology for space studies at Anoya facilities, and it's really extraordinary. I had the chance to visit uh, Anoya Yalmar and Katie this summer and see some of this, and also seen the, 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 the beauty of students really eager to to, to launch rockets from an Io space station, that's special. In the Birkland lecture, Dr. Rovland will present the scientific results of his work with sounding rockets. So Dr. Rovland, we are happy and honored that you have, that you're here and are looking forward to your lecture. Fountains in the sky, following Earth's leaky atmosphere into space. The floor is yours and we are looking forward to that. Thank you so much. It's so humbling to be here in this great uh, place with Christian Birkeland looking down on us. I remember when I was in uh, Minnesota in the early, late 1990s, early 2000s, Alf Egeland would come and he would come to Augsburg College and University of Minnesota and just tell us all about the great things that Christian Birkeland had done. And I would never have guessed that I'd be here uh, 20 years from now. Very humbling experience. So thank you. And thank you to the Birkeland Committee and to Jorn Moen and to uh, Jan Holstedt for really showing a great, a great side of Oslo and giving us a good chance to explore and, and, and visit everyone. And I really look forward to talking with more of you uh, following this, this, this talk. Uh, so my, my presentation is, 
is called Fountains in the Sky, and what I want to tell you about is something that's been known for a long time, but that we're getting some more um, uh, recent insight into, and that is the fact that Earth's atmosphere is slowly leaking into space. It's being heated by the aurora, Christian Birkeland's one of his many regions of study, and it's being shot off into space. Not to worry, we have billions of years of oxygen left on our planet, but these same processes may be happening at Mars, at Venus, at exoplanets throughout the, the galaxy, throughout the universe, and it may, in fact, determine how, whether those planets are habitable or not. So this is a very important fundamental process that occurs everywhere, and it has many ties to Birkeland's work, which is why I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about it. So we usually think about uh, the, the space, the region above us, as being empty. And uh, when you go above the troposphere where we live and breathe, the stratosphere where we fly our airplanes, we still have much atmosphere there. Uh, it's plenty of atmosphere. It's enough to support the aurora. It's enough to support electrical currents. And it's enough to produce a drag on the International Space Station and satellites that are there as they fly through this region. They have wind resistance because there's still atmosphere there. And that atmosphere continues all the way up beyond 650 kilometers. And a portion of it becomes ionized, the ionosphere. This is, space is just far from empty, and this is one of Birkeland's fundamental insights, was that before he came around, people thought this was a vacuum. But his insights into uh, the solar and stellar evolution of, of uh, cathode rays and, and, and uh, similar phenomena that the space was full of these things, and it was, in fact, he, he hypothesized that the space between the stars had more matter than the stars themselves, which was just fascinating at the time, really groundbreaking. And so it's true, and uh, this is something that we want to study, is how, does that, how do those, uh, those gases get, get to outer space? Some of them come from comets, from other sources, many from the sun, but importantly, some from Earth itself. So uh, one question people have is we have sort of this picture here. This is an artist's conception. In the top is the sun, and these rays streaming from the sun are the solar wind. Uh, and then on the bottom, we have a picture of, in this case, Mars, but all planets have this sort of effect. And what you can see is this sort of stream of, of, of particles coming out of the atmosphere of Mars. This is a planetary es atmospheric escape. The source of the MAVEN mission is studying this at Mars right now. It's very nice at Mars because Mars has no mag magnetic field. I'll talk about that shortly. But the idea is that the solar wind comes in and strips the atmosphere from Mars and has been doing so for billions of years. And so what once might have been a lush planet with water and a breathable atmosphere and possibly life now has a very thin atmosphere that is only 1% that of Earth's. And this is one of the major reasons why. The fact that it has a very low mass and thermal escape occurs, but also the solar wind can strip away the atmosphere. So we want to understand how that works and what does it mean for life here on Earth and elsewhere in the, in the universe. So thermal escape, I mentioned, this is a very simple process where if you have a gas that is at a certain temperature, some fraction of the gas, if it's got a distribution, will be at a very high velocity, and if it's at escape velocity, it will then leave the, the planet. And so this happens for very light species at Earth, it happens for heavier species even at Mars because it's a smaller planet. And, uh, and this is sort of the, the effect, but it depends very strongly on the mass of the planet, the composition of the atmosphere, and importantly, the temperature of the atmosphere, because the cooler uh, planets will not have as much uh, escape. So there's a nice, a nice f figure here that shows in the top left sort of the larger planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and in the bottom is sort of the moons down here. And as you go up, you go, you go to higher escape velocity and larger mass, and to the right, you go to higher temperatures. So for very cold uh, planets, or very massive planets, they tend to hold on to their atmosphere. For very hot or very small bodies, they tend to lose their atmosphere. And you can kind of see which gases can free escape from planets of different size and temperature. So if you look at uh, Jupiter and, and Saturn, the large planets, he, uh, they, they hold on to basically everything. When you get onto Earth and Venus, you start to lose hydrogen, helium, et cetera. And as you go down, you, get, you, can, you can lose even, small, even heavier gases. And the important thing is that um, before sort of not in the late 1960s, this fact that Earth could lose oxygen, for example, was very surprising. You know, we, we would uh, go up in space and measure hydrogen and helium, and that could be coming from the sun, it'd be coming from Earth because it's such a light gas. When oxygen was discovered around Earth with a single electron missing, O+, plus, it was clear that was coming from the Earth and not from the sun, because if it come from the sun, it would have a very high charge state. So that was a very big surprise. And in particular, it was a surprise because the Earth's atmosphere, the oxygen ions that are there, are around 0.1 electron volts. They're about uh, 1,000 degrees Kelvin. And when they're observed in outer space, they have energies ranging from 10 electron volts to 10,000 electron volts or higher. 
And so that's a huge energization you have to take place uh, in, that, in, that, in that region. And in particular, getting from the 0.1 electron volt to 10 is what you need to get to escape velocity for oxygen. So to get out into space, you need to energize by about a factor of 100. And so when you, when you look at all those processes, the question is, how does that happen? How did that, how did that oxygen gain that much energy? And, and if it was just thermal escape, we wouldn't see nearly the amount that's out there. So we have these uh, studies for the last, I would say, 60 years almost, of how does that oxygen and, and other heavier gases like nitric oxide and, and molecular nitrogen, how do those get energized and get kicked out into space and leave the, leave the, uh, leave the Earth? And the answer is related to what I showed you before. It's, if it was just thermal escape, the oxygen would be bound. But because of the solar wind and the plasma and the electric and magnetic fields in that, in that gas, there are plasma processes that can energize those ions, energize them to very high energies and kick them out. And again, this is something of Birkeland's uh, insight was that uh, gravity, many people thought that only gravity was the most consequential force in the universe. But his insight was that electromagnetic forces were extremely important, and it and is so here, in the fact that the planets may, may be habitable or inhabitable based partly on their gravity and based partly on the interaction of these electromagnetic forces. So let's see. This is an example, just for your visual, of how planets are bathed in the solar wind that comes from the sun. This is Mars in particular. And what you're going to see is the this, this solar wind coming and forming a shock wave around the planet. And then what you're going to see is the resulting ions being kicked out by the solar wind effect. And that's a much larger atmospheric escape or leaky atmosphere than you would see if there were no solar wind. If it was just the sunlight shining on the, on the planet. On the Earth, we have something called aurora, which are very fam uh, famous to those of you who are studying Birkeland's work. Uh, the aurora are a, a visible manifestation of energy being deposited into the Earth's atmosphere. And so that energy is a source of, of heating, ionization, and also plasma waves, very importantly, plasma, plasma energization processes that can come in and, and, and ionize our atmosphere, energize those ions to very high energies, and then escape from the Earth. So the aurora are intimately tied to this process. And where we have aurora, we have atmospheric escape, and that's, that's a very common linkage, and I think Birkeland would have been very happy to, to study this phenomenon because it's, it's sort of a universal phenomenon. When you have this aurora coming in, as I said, you have these atmospheric fountains. This is sort of an artist's conception where you just sort of see this gas streaming out, but um, if you could see it with your eye, it would probably look very similar. I want to just contrast between the two cases. On the left, we have Mars, which again, we know that the atmosphere there has escaped over billions of years. Part of the reason, a major reason, is because it is a lower mass planet, smaller diameter, lower mass, less gravity to hold on to its atmosphere. But importantly, it has no magnetic field, no, no, no longer has a magnetic field that may have had one in the past. And so the solar wind can basically impact almost anywhere on the planet and strip off atmosphere. And over time, it has lost most of its atmosphere. On the right is a picture of the Earth that has not only a larger mass, but this magnetic field. And there's a currently a very big debate. Does the magnetic field protect the Earth? Sort of anecdotally, we have a lot of atmosphere and something must be protecting it. Probably a lot of that is just due to our higher gravity relative to, to Mars. But the magnetic field could either act as a shield because it, it tends to deflect the solar wind and keep it from impacting our atmosphere. But it also acts as a giant funnel or sail that can extract energy from the solar wind over a very large region and funnel it down into the rural regions and the high latitude regions. And so what that does is it, it forms a very active generator circuit and a lot of energy is dumped into these very localized regions. And that's what you need to get the oxygen energized because you're talking about, again, energizing these ions by a factor of 100 or 1,000 or more. And so having this focus of the energy of the solar wind down into the rural regions is a major uh, aspect of a planet like Earth that you don't have at Mars. So one of the open questions is how does this vary? If we look at all these exoplanets that have been discovered over the last years, and they all have different sizes, different distances from their planets, different magnetic fields, how would they behave? We don't know. This is why we want to go out and take a look and use James Webb Space Telescope and future missions to understand them. Uh, it's because they are all sort of different, and uh, even in our own system, we have Venus and Earth, which are very similar. Venus has no magnetic field, is about the same mass, but it has a very, very thick atmosphere. So there's a lot of these different phenomena that control the atmospheric thickness. It's not just the plasma physics, but it, I want to show you that the plasma physics is important. When we talk about exoplanets, there's very commonly described something called the Goldilocks zone. And the Goldilocks zone is the region 
around a star where water can be liquid on the surface. And with our current understanding of how life would form, we think water is very important for all of us, we heard earlier. Uh, and so this is some work by my colleague, uh, Catherine Garcia-Sage, who studied what Proxima Centauri b would be. Proxima Centauri b is the nearest exoplanet to Earth, only a few light years away. And it's thought that this is a, a planet approximately Earth-like. Uh, there could be an Earth-like planet around Proxima Centauri. And because that is a much dimmer star, you have to get much closer to the star to have um, li liquid water on the surface. But it happens to be that Proxima Centauri b is, is, is in that approximate uh, range of the Goldilocks zone. So we might think, let's go study that. Let's go, let's go put the James Webb Telescope on Proxima Centauri and look for, look for Earth-like planets, look for water signatures, and see what we can find. And what her work showed was that if you took not just the light and the, and the heat from the star and took that into account, if you took the solar wind and the um, ultraviolet light from the star and all these other high energy effects, Proxima Centauri would lose its atmosphere in hundreds of millions to billions of years for the process we're going to talk about in a moment. And that's basically the ultraviolet light comes in, it, it, it uh, ionizes and, and excites the gas, and the plasma effects in the solar wind tend to strip that, that, uh, that air atmosphere away in just a short period of time, cosmologically speaking. So we are hopeful that we will find planets with life, but it may be that Proxima Centauri is an example of the kind of planet where uh, there are other effects besides uh, just the starlight uh, impacting things. So when we talk about these different uh, sort of non-thermal processes, we talk about sort of a host of them, and the key is that there are many, many different processes that can interact, and they may, in fact, all work together in a, in a uh, complicated ladder of, of effects to, to make the outflow happen, the atmospheric escape happen. And the reason you can see is, is sort of a, a, this simple, uh, well, simple diagram here. The, uh, the white curve is where the plasma, where the ionized gas is around the Earth, how it varies with the altitude. And you can kind of see that at some altitude above 100 kilometers, we start getting this atmospheric plasma. The red curve shows you the atmosphere, the neutral atmosphere that we breathe. That falls off as you go up in altitude. It starts out very dense here at the Earth at surface and then falls off. And what that means is the plasma can, can uh, be running into, colliding with the neutral density, the neutral gas, and when you get below a certain altitude, the neutral gas dominates everything, and it collides. In the case, if you started to put energy into any ions, they would re immediately run into a neutral gas atom or molecule. They would lose their energy, and they would not gain that energy that they need to get escape velocity. At very high energy, very high altitude, those ions can travel a long distance, a long mean free path before they tend to collide. And so in between, there's sort of this region where the scale height of the atmosphere and the mean free path are about the same. And then if you start to put in energy at that location, you can get the ions to go a long way. So you, they, can, they can escape away from the Earth. They can also do that if you, if you go to, put the energy in high altitude. But the key is most of the ions are in this region near where that transition height is. So when you want to study how do ions get accelerated and escape out, you could look down low, but you would probably see a lot of cases where the ions would be energized and then immediately quenched by their collisions. If you look up high, you would see lots of acceleration processes, but you wouldn't have a lot of ions around to accelerate. So there's sort of this sweet spot, around 500 kilometers, it varies, where you have a lot of ions around, and they can be efficiently accelerated long distances. So that's sort of where we're focusing. I'll show you that in a second. But essentially, this, this region around 500 kilometers, it's perfect for sounding rockets. We can reach this quite easily with our sounding rockets. And uh, it's the region where you have the sweet spot between having the most ions around and having the most efficient energization. I won't go into the details on this slide, but essentially we have these multiple processes I mentioned that can take these ions, again, at 0.1 electron volts and energize them to very high energies. And they're sort of arranged in, in altitude order. So as you start with the blue, that's at the lowest altitudes, very heavily dominated by collisions. And the main energy there is essentially the Birkeland current comes in. It generates the horizontal ionospheric current. And then those currents are like the heater in your toaster, where they can basically just dump energy and resistively into the gas and basically just heat the whole gas and cause it to expand. But they don't give a lot of energy to any, any particular ion. They just kind of heat the bulk process. As you go higher and higher, there are different interactions here. 
that can be more effective at energizing individual ions. And in particular, the one that is the most efficient, I guess, uh, whoops, is this top, this top one here, this wave-particle interaction. These are unique to plasma phenomena. You don't have them when you don't have the electric and magnetic fields in the gas. Uh, they tend to be uh, a wide variety of different waves, ranging from alphane waves uh, that Hans Alphane discovered, and he probably spoke about here in 1987, the beginning of the Birkeland lecture, uh, all the way to higher frequency waves that we'll show you in a second. So, so this, this range of, of, uh, of, of processes as you go from sort of 100 kilometers up to several hundred kilometers and then higher, this is sort of how things go. And the reality is we don't know which processes happen are, which, one, which ones happen when, how they couple together to produce the observed flow. What we know is we see high altitude atmosphere escaping, and we, we see different, different uh, energy sources coming in, the aurora coming in that region, but we don't quite know how all these, re all these processes couple together. Do you have to have a lot of heating in order to get escape? How do the waves vary with altitude and so on? So there's a lot of open questions about how these processes combine together, and that's, that's a currently a subject of, of much research. So uh, we had this mission, Visions 2, that was mentioned, and this is um, uh, our sounding rocket mission that we launched in 2018 from the Allison. And the purpose of Visions 2 was to learn how atmosphere is heated by solar wind interactions and escapes into space. And we went to a place in the Allison that has access to Earth's magnetic cusp, I'll show you what the cusp is in a second, where the aurora is shooting electrons down into the atmosphere. Those electrons directly heat the atmosphere, but they also destabilize and generate waves that can be uh, part of this wave-particle interaction. And the result of all these different processes here in the center is the heated oxygen ions escaping. And we want to understand how, how important each of these different terms might be. So this rocket mission is, uh, you know, many, NASA and, and the Norwegians have done together many rocket missions and very exciting ones. This is one of the more recent ones, and four years ago. And what we did was we launched uh, two, two rockets from the Allisund. We had one that was flying higher, say to 800 kilometers, and one that was flying lower to about 600 kilometers. We launched them on the same trajectory, just about, just a different apogee. And we launched them about two minutes apart. And this is the kind of technology that, that uh, Endoya Space can really support very well. They have the ability to very accurately control uh, the direction, the, la the launch, the location of all these different uh, missions. And, and have multiple rockets in the air at the same time and beating telemetry down and all these different things. So very pleased to work with Andoya Space uh, to, to make this happen. And without Andoya Space, I would say we would not be able to do this research at all. The launch site, the support, the technical, and the logistics, all very key to the success. As well as scientifically, we had uh, great success from Joran Moen and his team, and also uh, Chelmore Oksevek I saw in the, in the audience, uh, Andrew Speicher, and, uh, and also... Um, uh, the Chell Henriksen Observatory as well. So we had lots of great Norwegian science, technology, and engineering support on this mission. Uh, just to give you an idea, if you're familiar with the other missions that NASA is doing, we have something called the Parker Solar Probe, which is currently on its, I don't know, seventh or eighth orbit around the sun, and every orbit it gets closer to the sun. And you might ask, why are they going to the sun? Well, part of the reason is something that I think Christian Birkeland would have appreciated. We go because it's there and because it's unexplored. We've never been. So we're going there with this, this mission, but in a way, the mission is very, again, something that, that Birkeland would have appreciated. I think he had this model of how the, um, the sun was emitting these uh, cathode rays and how that worked, and that was sort of controversial at the time, but he was proved right. And, and the cathode rays we now know are part of an electrically neutral flow of plasma called the solar wind, and we know the solar wind, by the time it reaches us, is moving quite rapidly, hundreds or thousands of kilometers per second, but close to the sun, it moves very slowly. And this is directly analogous to, this, to the planetary escape. As you get close to the sun, the velocity here is low. And as you get out, it kind of reaches a steady state acceleration. And there's this acceleration region between a few times the sun's diameter and maybe five or 10 times the sun's diameter, where all that acceleration of the gas happens. And so Parker Solar Probe is the first mission to dive into this region and really sample how these acceleration processes happen. And again, many of them are generated by plasma waves or uh, various plasma phenomena that actually accelerate this gas as it moves out. Similarly, we have models that show that this atmospheric escape also starts at a very low altitude where the collisions tend to quench that atmospheric escape, and there's a region from about three or 400 kilometers to 
maybe 1,500 kilometers, where most of the acceleration of the gas happens. And so this is the region we're targeting. I mentioned that sort of sweet spot where the, um, where the mean free path and the scale height are the same. And the key region is below about 1,000, which makes it a perfect target for sounding rockets. So why the cusp? The cusp is a term I mentioned before. This is a picture of the Earth's magnetic field in our artist's conception. And the Earth's magnetic field generally pr protects the Earth from the solar wind. But there are these regions in the poles, north and south pole, where there is a weak spot in the, in the magnetic field where the solar wind can basically enter directly and impact the atmosphere. And so the reason that's very important is because we have aurora everywhere at the high latitudes. We have night side aurora, and, and, which is what we're used to. We're used to seeing this green aurora that happens. And that's maybe primarily what uh, Christian Birkeland studied. But we also know that there are aurora that occur in the daytime. And those aurora are under the magnetic cusp. And this is the result of this solar wind plasma coming in directly and interacting with the atmosphere. So this is kind of a unique region. There are two of them. And every day, uh, the Earth rotates. And this, this is sort of stays fixed, always on the side facing the sun. So as you rotate around, you would rotate underneath this fixed feature. Uh, and I'll get back to why, why, why we care about that in a second. For those of you who don't know sounding rockets, the reason we call them sounding rockets is because they, they sound or they take a profile through the atmosphere, and that's very important for the reasons I'll go into. Uh, we basically have a lot of measurements from satellites that, that cut across horizontally. With satellite, they kind of come across at a certain altitude. But this, the rocket goes up and then comes back down. And that's actually a feature for us because we want to measure the vertical behavior. We want to measure how that things change with altitude. And you can't do that on a satellite. You have to have a sounding rocket that goes up, flies through the region, and comes down. So typically, these last for 5 to 15 minutes, and they can reach apogees as high as 1,000 th kilometers or more. And they can carry payloads of up to 500 kilograms, perhaps even more. I'm not sure what the latest from Andoya Space is. But the key is this vertical profile. That's going to be key to our, to our presentation. Um, I mentioned our partnership with Andoya Space. This is actually a much larger partnership. It was mentioned earlier. Uh, it's a multinational partnership between Norway. Uh, Norway really began this. Uh, we had some conversations. I think Kolbjorn Blix, who's here, Chel Bon, and Jorn Moen came and really were trying to um, show everyone how important it was to have these international partnerships and how valuable we could, we could make this if we could kind of coordinate together. And this is, this is something that was very valuable. So when that first came, I don't know, 2010 or so, when you st guys started uh, talking to us about it, that was very exciting. And then eventually... Um, the Norwegian government and Japan, and, and there's a NASA representative at the table as well, got together to make this international partnership. The key is it was a multinational process to help us logistically organize, but also to share data, to share planning, uh, to help uh, fundraise projects and that sort of thing. And it's just a very, uh, very nice way to get things going. I think any individual nation would have had trouble doing something of this scope, but together we can do it very well. And uh, the other advantage of it was that it gave some students very great educational experience. We had a student rocket led by Kolbjorn, uh, and we had many students and graduate students and postdocs involved in this project. And having that large, uh, I think there were something like 12 rockets being launched over a period of several years, really concentrated the effort and let us have a lot of training activities for the next generation, which I think is very important. So again, this is similar in concept to Birkeland's polar campaigns. You know, just making a really focused effort for several years to study one thing particularly in detail, and also leveraging measurements made by many different groups to get the complete picture. So these synergies are very important. I think we had launch vehicles provided by uh, Nor Norway, US, and Japan, instrumentation from all three, as well as Canada. And I think the Norwegians were on every single rocket, or maybe at least most of them. You guys had instrumentation, which is great. Um, Ground-based observations, we had ICECAT, was a really fast, fantastic radar in Longyearbyen, uh, the Cutlass radars and the Kel Hendrickson Observatory, as well as University of Oslo had some great cameras there. So we shared expertise to design these missions, uh, determine launch criteria, analyze the data. Very good s support from Andoya Space, Kings Bay Corporation, which runs the research station in the Allison, and the Norwegian government, I want to express my thanks because they worked hard to install a second launch pad in the Allison. We had one launch pad there, one launcher, and the second launch pad really made our mission possible because we had two rockets that had to be in the air at the same time. And these things take several days to load. So you have to preload them both on launchers and then launch one, launch the other. You don't have time to, 
to reload them. So having the second launch pad is what made, it, made this possible, so thank you so much. Uh, we definitely benefited from logistics, saving time and effort in, in tracking and telemetry and uh, shipping costs and so on. Just a lot of great leverage, leveraging and sy synergy. And because he's here in the audience tonight, I'm, I just wanted to point out, uh, very happy to see this piece of paper here. This is in the launcher at Nielsen, and, and the name that you may not be able to see is, is Ivan Tron is on here. Uh, he had the first rocket from the Allison in 1997. And so we're very pleased to be able to follow in his footsteps. And Robert Pfaff and several others here have, uh, have launched there. So the Allison is a routine launch site. It is uh, something that's been supported for many years. It is a lot more logistics to launch from there. So we try to uh, make sure that we have a really good reason to go there. But it's a very unique site. I think nowhere in the world do we have this kind of uh, situation as the Allison. I'll show you that in a second. So I mentioned the Grand Challenge. We have this Grand Challenge, which is just completed, just recently completed with the launch of all the missions, and very successful. And the next step, which I think Colby, and if you talk to him at dinner, he might be able to share some more information, is the next Grand Challenge. And this one is so great, uh, we wanted to really expand it. And uh, Colburn's been working to get great international partnership on this for the next one, uh, beyond just our three nations. Uh, he has a, many, a long list of, of interested countries, interested institutions, and this is a reality, this is happening, and it started, and I think that, I don't know when the first launch has already happened or is about to happen, and this one has a little bit different focus. Instead of being on the magnetic cusp, it's on a different part of the atmosphere, but it's, um, it's very exciting, and I look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, maybe tonight we'll hear something from Colby Arm. But again, the key is, it also has a great student involvement, a really great way to train the next generation of scientists and engineers. So here's a picture of our Grand Challenge cusp, and I think uh, Kettle showed this earlier. We have Andoya launch, we have Nielsen launch, and we have some rockets launched here and some launched here. They're not in the air at the same time, but having the ability to get different cuts through this region, whereas we launch in different directions at different times, really gives us a focused database that's really unprecedented. I think we've had other cases where we launch one or two rockets here, and then several years later we launch one more, and it just is a, it's a long process of get, gathering the data. This is a very focused period where we had nine missions comprising 12 rockets uh, launched in a, a two or three year period. And we have all these great ground radars and, uh, from the Cutlass and the ISCAT radars and, and others, other phenomena here. So why do we go to, to Nielsen? Uh, Nielsen is really unusual, it's unique for many reasons, but one of the reasons it's unique is because it's connection to the magnetic cusp. Every single day, the magnetic cusp rotates, uh, the Svalbard rotates under the magnetic cusp. And so it is the only uh, land-based uh, settlement that has an airport a, a, uh, and, a, and a seaport for shipping where you can launch rockets directly into the magnetic cusp. There's nowhere else on Earth that has this capability. Very unique. And that's the reason it really has been a, a long-time favorite of ours for studying the scientific topics. And so for those who haven't been there, I recommend. I was there in the winter. I'd like to go again in the summer sometime. But in the winter, it was just wonderful. I'll show you some pictures. But the key is that every day you get a chance to launch into the cusp. We have the excellent ISCAT radar here in Longyearbyen. The launch facility is here in the Allison, and we launch south, and then the radar can track uh, the phenomenon going on the ionosphere as they go. And again, another connection to Birkeland is that his excellence station was the first permanent research outpost on Svalbard, and we're just trying to continue that, that very famous tradition. So there's a map of the, of the town. The town is in the winter is about 35 people, in the summer is a couple hundred. It's very small, but just very has all the logistics you need to, to get everything done. Uh, in the spirit of the of the Allison, I, uh, another sort of related discovery, Voyager discovery that went there was um, Amundsen took one of his uh, airship flights from there to the North Pole and was the first uh, first to overfly the North Pole. Uh, and then later they had, uh, uh, unfortunately, the accident there uh, that, that, that cost their, their lives. But um, this is just, this Nialison is just a great place. It, when you get there, you feel this sense of discovery and the sense of history really tying you back to, to, uh, to lots of future, uh, previous discoveries. When you, when you think about going there, though, again, we have these, um, the challenges, and they're nothing like what the Birkeland group went through in 1902. They had much more severe challenges. But even today, I would say there's still significant challenges going here. You know, you have 24-7 uh, darkness, uh, it's very windy, you know, you have radio quiet zone, uh, and so on, and even polar bears. 
And when I was tickled when I went there, because maybe this is familiar to many Norwegians, but I had never seen these signs before, which tell you that if you leave town, you better have a, a rifle with you. And indeed, here is someone walking through the, the darkness with their rifle on their shoulder. So but that was always very interesting. It's a little bit different than we will launch in Virginia, because Virginia has no polar bears, at least that I know of, <laughs> maybe in the zoo. If you haven't been there, it's a, just fab, fabulously beautiful, even in the winter, especially in the winter, maybe, because you have these northern lights. Uh, you have, uh, this is actually um, a cemetery for coal miners. This has been a coal mining area for many years, and uh, uh, just a beautiful, very moving uh, monument to their, their work and their lives. But the, the, the mountain there, the, the aurora, the stars, it, just a fantastic uh, scenery when you're there as well. And uh, in addition to the Scenery, probably more important, is the people are very beautiful. The people are very welcoming. We were there for five weeks, and, and there were maybe 35 people overwintering in the research station. We brought another 35. So you can imagine it was kind of a party for, for a month or so. And every night, this is the calendar while we were there, every night there's something going on, hockey or a uh, different quiz bowl or something. And they just really made us feel at home. It was, it was 24-7 darkness, and yet just felt like we were part of the, 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 um, the team there. They gave us a nice American Thanksgiving. We had a Christmas party with special beer from Longyearbyen, and we even had a karaoke party. And I say, I still maintain that it's the world's northernmost karaoke party ever. I'm going to call up the Guinness Book of World Records to see if that's true. Uh, I couldn't have done this without our team. This is a small fraction of our team. These are the, the, field, the field campaign team from NASROC, from Andoya Space, uh, from our instrument teams in Oslo and elsewhere. Uh, but of course, the sounding rocket group at NASA and uh, Kings Bay Company, everyone. It, was, took, it takes hundreds of people to do one of these big campaigns and uh, really grateful to everyone's support. I'll just get into briefly what we saw. Just in the, I know we're standing between you and dinner, so I want to make sure I'm on time here. Uh, what, we, what we do with these rockets is, the, uh, in addition to being able to go vertically uh, and really sample the vertical distribution, a major advantage of the rocket is you can wait until you see what you want and launch into it. If you have a, a satellite that's just orbiting and there's some rare phenomena, you, you, may, you may get lucky and you may run into it once in a while. But your odds of hitting it are very low on any given orbit. So often with a satellite, you might spend years trying to get the right configuration of, of, uh, of measurements and observations together. With a rocket, you wait until it is there in front of you and you launch into it and you get it, hopefully, every time. That's, that's the idea anyway. And in our case, we wanted it's something even more difficult. We wanted to have two rockets in the air at the same time at different altitudes. And that's, again, to sample this vertical distribution in a different way. And that would, that would be very rare with multiple satellites. If you have multiple satellites that are kind of orbiting, they all have different periods, their, their planes are different, and just the idea of having two satellites going together simultaneously at different altitudes is not easy. With the rocket program and the support of Andoya Space, we were able to do this quite nicely, and it's just a really great opportunity. For those of you who haven't uh, done the rocket work in this, in this way, one of the key things we do is we wait and we watch the solar wind and we watch the radar. And so I had sort of two displays. One was this um, up weather, upstream space weather buoy. I talked to Paolo Brecker earlier. He mentioned SOHO. Uh, SOHO and other missions are up there about 45 minutes upstream. They, they give us a constant read on what the, uh, what the solar wind is doing. That solar wind that I mentioned before is one of the things that strips away atmosphere from the Earth. And in particular, the magnetic field of the solar wind, as it rotates between pointing in the same direction as Earth's field, that's not very much, that doesn't transfer very much energy, so you don't have very much um, auroral es atmospheric escape or auroral activity. But when the magnetic field of the solar wind goes negative or southward, and it's oppositely directed to the Earth's magnetic field, then you get a lot of energy transfer, a lot of aurora, and a lot of atmospheric escape. So you can imagine what we're doing a lot of the time is we're waiting, we're watching the wind, making sure the surface winds and the rocket can be launched. But even if that's true, we have to wait for the energy to come in and really drive the aurora activity. And so we watch this, this, this upstream buoy, and we can see this on the internet. We can watch it kind of tra trailing along, and then suddenly dive southward. And when this is happening, you're building up energy, you're building up aurora in the, in the, uh, in, in the region where we want to study. Simultaneously, we were watching the radar. And so I remember Chelmar and, uh, and, uh, and Uran and others were, were watching the radar to tell us, okay, what's, this is what we think is happening. 
coming into the Earth's atmosphere. But the radar, the ice cap radar, really tells you what's actually happening locally where you are. So it's actually able where you can sort of see these invisible processes. Where is the cusp located and how is it putting energy in? And so the combination of watching this and trying to guess, okay, this went south. And if you imagine you're watching this, you don't know if it's going to continue on south or if it's going to pop back up as it did in this case. So it's a lot of tension, a lot of... Uh, 10 or 15 of us scientists standing around in the corner, staring at a big screen, trying to decide what's going to happen. Should we get ready? Should we not get ready? And uh, a lot of questions like that. So I mentioned the radar. This is actually a very powerful radar. There's actually, they're actually building an even more powerful one in Long Urban, but this is the current version. Uh, Chelmar was able to supply this beautiful data. They have two dishes. One looks straight up, and one looks, can, can be steered. And we had it looking down where the rocket was going to fly. And so this first one looks straight up over Long Urban, and what you can notice is this panel here. This is the electron temperature, which is an indication of when the cusp is over your head. And so we can see even, say, at uh, 10.50 a.m., we, uh, we had cusp over our heads in Long Urban, but we wanted it to be overhead further south where the rocket was going. So Chalmar parked the other radar dish looking where the rocket was going to go, and we could see here that the temperature became enhanced where the rocket was a few minutes after 11. So that's about when we decided to launch. Remember, Jelmar and Bjorn are sitting there trying to figure out, should we go, should we go? And you only get one chance. Once you hit go, you've, you've gone. And that's four years of work that you've just used. And you better go to the right time. So thank you very much to Jelmar and Bjorn. I owe you a big time. I'll buy you with some Aquavit later. But uh, anyway, we decided to go. And in fact, we launched and hit a beautiful event. This is a picture from Yachi Chin at uh, University of Oslo. They have beautiful cameras that they were watching the aurora. And this is sort of a, a way of, of showing how the aurora are behaving with latitude and time. So you can kind of see uh, th they kind of fill all latitudes early on. And then there's these periods where the aurora are kind of moving southward. They start at a high latitude, move southward. Uh, and we ended up flying these two rockets. These, these two lines are the two rocket uh, trajectories basically right through one of these events. So this is very nice, where we can fly through the aurora as it's happening, as it's dumping energy in, as it's kicking the atmosphere out. And so really appreciate the support of the University of Oslo all-sky cameras, just wonderful instruments. So this is a picture. Uh, Jim Hecht actually had cameras on board the rocket. On the right, you'll see the University of Oslo camera looking up, and the green light is the aurora happening. We're launching from here, this is the trajectory, and this diamond shows you the rocket flying through this region of enhanced aurora. You can see how variable it is. You know, as you're launching, the aurora is brightening, it's dimming, it's moving around. On the left is a camera on board the rocket from Jim Hecht, and I don't know if I can go backwards. I may have, uh, let's see if I can do that. Let me just go back. If you, if you watch this, you can kind of see that we start, they're not quite synchronized, but you can see we fly through this region of aurora, this is a, a camera on the rocket looking backwards, and it's looking to the north as we fly south. And you can see this aurora here. This is the, the region we flew through. And as we come over across the, uh, across the cusp, we're looking backwards, a sideways view into the aurora, which is something that I think Brooklyn would have loved to have. They were trying to triangulate at what height the aurora happens. And we were able to do this, in this case, with the modern technology by having uh, the rocket basically be looking across this way. And so this gives you an idea of how variable the aurora are. So the energy is coming in where it's bright, and you can see how spatially patchy that is, how temporally variable it is. And you can imagine that trying to hit those patches and measure where the, where the atmosphere is escaping is, is not easy. But we managed, we got lucky. So I'll just briefly talk about some of the results. We did observe atmospheric escape. Uh, that's uh, very interesting. We, we measure the energy inputs that cause that. And we have, I think, new information about the wave modes that may be responsible for heating these ions. So on the left is a very complicated picture, but I want you to focus on the bottom. This is the flight time of the rocket from when it reaches altitude towards when it has about the apogee, and then it comes down again. And these are a particular look direction of where the ions, energetic ions, we, we think they're oxygen ions, are coming relative to the rocket. In this case, they're coming from below the rocket. And so these ions, they're something like 5 to 20 electron volts. And for, hydro, for oxygen, the um, escape velocity is about 10 or 11 electro, ele electron volts. So already, at these altitudes, there is oxygen ions that have enough energy to escape the atmosphere. 
And remember, the typical energy is more like 0.1 electron volts. So these guys are already energized by a hundred factor of 100 and already have enough energy to reach much higher altitudes and escape the Earth's atmosphere. So this is the key thing that we're trying to measure are these upgoing ions. And you might say, well, what causes them? Well, uh, as you look up the, up the plot, this top plot is probably the second most interesting thing, which is the electrons that are coming in that create the aurora. So these electrons come in, they strike the atmosphere, and they generate the aurora light. And you can see they're very, as I showed before, the camera, they're very patchy, they're very structured. They don't, they're not a nice, smooth variation. But they tend to be uh, very strong right where this atmospheric escape is happening in general. So in, a big pic in the big picture sense, these are providing the energy that is driving this. But in detail, they don't line up exactly. So you can't exactly make a one-to-one -one connection between these electrons and these ions. So we look for other connections. And the main connection we see are these electric and magnetic waves that we see on, on the rocket. And these are, again, these ions are positively charged. And if you push an electric field on them, they will, they will move in response. And they can gain energy if, if, the, if the push is in the right place. So we have, with our electric field measurement, this is courtesy of Rob Pfaff, this is provided by Jim Clemens on the left. The, uh, the electric field has a very strong component that's in the sort of the static component, large scale component. And then we have this spikes on here, this fuzz. This is what we call alphane waves after Hannes Alphane, who discovered them. Uh, and these are very large amplitude variations in the electric field that can push directly on the, on the ions and heat them. And then we have higher frequency waves that can also perform some resonant acceleration of the of the ions. So there's multiple choices here. We could be heating these ions directly with a large-scale uh, resistive heating. We can be using ponder mode of acceleration from the alphane waves, and then we can have different frequencies of sort of uh, coherent uh, or incoherent random acceleration, uh, uh, resonant acceleration. I'm not going to go into this, but I guess the, the main point here is that we were very surprised to see altitudes of energization about below, below 400 kilometers. And I mentioned before that 500 kilometers is about where the collisions fall off enough that you can put energy into ions, have them maintain that energy, and, and go to high altitudes. But here we're seeing them at 372, which, which we were thought that was very low, and the collisions should quench the ion acceleration. Since our observations, uh, Shen reported 350, down to 350. So this is something we don't quite understand. There's, there's some process that is causing this heating at a much lower altitude than we would have expected. But it's possible that the atmosphere was just deflated on this day and there were fewer neutrals around. We don't have an independent measure of how dense the atmosphere is. But <clears throat> on average, this should be very low compared to what we expect. So that's, that's number one. Number two is we see a strong correlation between these very large alphane waves, which are these sort of spikes that you can see in this electric field signature, and the atmosphere that's leaking out. And so when I first made this slide, I thought that there was no, um, that these waves were too small to have produced the observed ions. But recently I've done some more checking in the literature and it seems as though we actually see a much more intense um, alphanic activity and much more likely that they could be helping to accelerate these ions. In particular, what happens is because we have this unique situation where we have a high flyer rocket and, and below it on the same magnetic field lines, a low flyer, we can find how the, al the amplitude of these waves changes with altitude. So these waves are propagating down the magnetic field, and they pass through the first rocket, and they pass through the second rocket. But in between, they have become attenuated. This, this signal is maybe two to three times the size of this signal. And that attenuation can be converted directly into a particle energization or, or resistive you know, damping. And so we're still studying this, but there's been some modeling efforts showing how you can convert you can estimate the particle energization from these change in the amplitude. And again, that wouldn't be possible if we didn't have two rockets measuring at different altitudes. In the past, you would measure this, or you would measure this, but you wouldn't know how the variation was, and you wouldn't know how the, uh, how the variation in altitude could be mapped into particle energization. So this is a new result that we're still working on, but I think these alpha any waves will be a very important, one of the major steps in getting these ions to energy. Finally, another thing that we, because of this two-point measurement, we have the first, I, I think the first measurement on two different magnetic field lines of these different waves that can resonantly accelerate the ions. So the alphane waves basically uh, sort of ponder motively, non-resonantly non accelerate the ions. These waves are resonant, and so we ha either have low-frequency waves that are exactly resonant with the ion motion around the magnetic field, 
That's these ELF, extremely, extremely low frequency waves. And we have very low frequency waves in the kilohertz range, which have a different resonance with the electrons, with the ions. And so the key is, these two rockets, this rocket and this rocket, are different altitudes. And they see approximately the same VLF intensity. But the ELF intensity is much weaker on the lower rocket. And yet, the lower rocket is the one that's already seeing energized ions at its location. So the, key, the, 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 the way to think about this is you have uh, a process that is occurring at or below the low, lower rocket that's energizing these. And if you look at these, this is sort of circumstantial, but if you look at these, the ELF waves are much weaker here. So the ELF waves might be responsible for further energizing the ions once they reach high altitudes. But in this case, it's circumstantially possible, at least, that the VLF waves are more important in this particular case. So we're still looking into this to try to understand this. But again, this, this fact that we have this measurements at two altitudes, only possible with sounding rockets, only possible to do this at Nialisand, where the cusp is, I think this kind of a unique data set that will shed a lot of light on how these processes energize the ions. So I, that's all I have, essentially, that we have um, very exciting measurements of this ion acceleration at very low altitudes, much very surprisingly low altitudes. Uh, we see three possible mechanisms that could have achieved that ionization, uh, energization. The alphanic activity is a very strong gradient with altitude, and that can provide a network, net upward acceleration. And then we have ELF and VLF wave power, again, measured at two points, and we th we're circumstantial evidence that the VLF acceleration may be more effective here. So we have further studies that are needed to understand how the altitude information that we have from Visions 2 lets us better co correlate these global models, the alphanic activity, the ELF and VLF. And we want to tie this back to the universal phenomena of atmospheric escape. How do these waves occur on Mars how, or on other planets? And how common are they? How common is this configuration? And how can we model what might be happening in other exoplanets in our galaxy or in our universe? That's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, I'm Jan Holtet. I'm, I'm a chairperson, as the head of the Birkeland Committee. And um, thank you for an excellent presentation. Fountains in the sky following Earth, leaky atmosphere into space. How come? The Earth leaky atmosphere. Do we have more to worry about? <laughs> <laughs> we had the ozone hole. We have the global warming. We have energy crisis. And we have a leaky atmosphere. <laughs> well, Doug, you took us through the story. You told us what it's all about. You told us about the vast effort made by multiple uh, sounding rockets from Andoya, from Svalbard, and you showed us data and made some what what the, will this mean? And then you ended up with more questions to come. We're not at the end. But do, I will start here. Are there more questions? Are there questions? <laughs> Paul. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, when you go up there preparing for the launch, uh, every day waiting and waiting, how long does it take you to prepare the launch every day to, to sit and wait? And then maybe you mentioned it, how fast can you launch when you see what you're waiting for? I think I saw one to two minutes or something. So the question was, was how long do we wait on any given day and then how long can we quickly can we go? Fortunately, we have very expert uh, sounding rocket uh, engineers and technicians at NASA and Doya, and they really know their stuff. And so usually what you do is you spend three weeks or so putting the rockets together, putting them in the launch range, testing them, getting them all ready. We run through a bunch of dress rehearsals just to make sure everything works, because every rocket is different. It's all a little bit custom. But after a while, you get into a habit and routine. I would say once we're up there, then every day we arrive something like three hours before the launch window, maybe four hours, and they're busy. Um, you know, they have to maybe, in this case, raise the launcher up, arm the rockets, do that sort of thing. That can take several hours. And then what we do is we start our countdown, and you can go all the way through those several hours, and eventually we hold at T minus 10 minutes, 10 minutes before launch. 
and then typically we can wait there forever. We can wait there all day because we're not on internal batteries. We're not, we're not using any, any resources. When we want to get ready, if we see something happening, like all of a sudden Chalmar calls and says, hey, the radar is showing some exciting stuff, we might count down to three minutes. At three minutes, typically, that's where we go onto the internal batteries of the rocket, and we can't wait forever because they would drain the batteries. So we can, we can wait there for 20 minutes or so. So it's about three minutes from, but even then, three minutes, then you launch, it takes you about three minutes to get to the altitude. So it's kind of a game, and with this cusp, it's very dynamic. It moves around a lot.